is scared of spiders. What about beetles? Cockroaches? You're not alone. It turns out people all over the world are scared of bugs. So how do we know this? Well, Hugh and I spent over a year asking people from all over the world questions like, what are you scared of? And in addition to bugs, here's a few of the things that other people say they are scared of. What am I scared of heights? Because I, my stomach feels like it's not going to be there anymore. <laughs> uh, miedo. Ser todos iguales. What am I scared of? I don't know. I already lost my dog. I'm scared when it doesn't rain. في كمان بعض الأشخاص إذا إذا بيكونوا حد بحسسوني بالأمر. سيدي رقوبة مهوكون نابنا كل بين بيبي وكو يوم نهتي زكوانا بكران جرو رقوبة كا هون أبي حبيبي. Sometimes you gotta be yourself and that sometimes scared me because. I'm way different than other people. I'm definitely afraid of politics. And um, I wish the people would have more of a say so. Harab, weapons, slay. I'm worried about our local town slowly losing population one of these days. Uh, it may dry out and blow away. Creo que lo único que le tengo miedo es. No tiene que ver conmigo, tiene que ver con mis hijas. Creo que no tenía miedo hasta que fui mamá. Ay. Me da miedo el tigre, porque nos puede comer. Me da mucho miedo el tigre. What are you scared of and why is just one of 20 questions that we asked in our interviews. We didn't just want to find out what people were scared of. We also wanted to know what makes people feel happy, what makes them angry, what makes them laugh. We asked questions about community, about love, death, innovation and the future. And then we turned the tables and we asked people to ask their own question. We said, if you could ask anybody anything, what question would you ask? We don't show people the questions beforehand, so all the answers are spontaneous. And I think it shows, don't you? Like when Morris talks about his fears for the future of his community, or when Hu from Kunming in China admits through her cheerful smile that she is scared of being lonely. Or Marianne, from Lima in Peru, who says she never really was scared until she became a parent. So why do this? Well, we live in quite a global time, don't you think? I mean, this thought strikes me every day, especially living somewhere like this in London. And we wanted to create a project that says something about the global age that we live in but that's grounded in the thoughts and experiences of people like you and me. At the beginning, Helen and I took a few weeks off work to go to a friend's wedding in Australia. And this seemed like as good an opportunity as any to take along a camera and have a go at starting to make this idea happen. We find people to interview in various ways. Sometimes we meet people in the streets. Sometimes we organise in advance, and sometimes we meet people entirely by accident. Well, we'd never have met Wolf if we hadn't gone completely off piece somewhere between Sydney and Melbourne. <laughs> we were utterly lost, in the middle of nowhere, and we hadn't even seen another car for about an hour, and it was getting dark. 
I mean, thank goodness there was space on Wolf and Fiona's farm for us to stay. When we woke up the next morning, we were really impressed with how vast and isolated this landscape we got ourselves lost in was. And we asked if we could do an interview. What are you scared of? I asked Wolf. I'm scared when it doesn't rain. Without rain, my crops can't grow and my livestock can't eat. Here, there's been seven consecutive years of drought. Some of my neighbours have just walked into the bank, dropped down the keys, unable to make the repayments. Asking Wolf about fear and hearing him talk about the rain really made me think differently about the climate and the landscape we were travelling through. On our return, we continue filming the 20 questions, building up materials for the project that we're making. And most interviews come from cities and towns. But inspired by experiences like our interaction with Wolf, we wanted to make sure that we included people from more remote places as well. And that's what got us in contact with Thierry. Once in a rock band in his native France, and now the founder of a nature reserve deep in the Amazon rainforest. Thierry's created a camp there, and that's where we're going to be staying. So Terry comes to meet us in an old, beaten up silver Cadillac. Not what you'd imagine seeing in the middle of the jungle. So we get in this bone shaker of a saloon car and we drive until we literally run out of road. The only way to get from here to the camp is half a day's journey on foot. When we finally do get there, Thierry introduces us to Yvonne, the seventh of nine children. She's lived here her whole life. Nimble and sure-footed, she's the one that guides us through the jungle. Not so nimble and a lot less sure-footed. We sort of stumble over big tree stumps and under low-hanging branches with our kit as we go and interview people from all over that area. At night times, we'd come back to the camp and we transfer what we'd shot and the light from our computer screens would shine very brightly in the absolute darkness of the jungle night, attracting all kinds of creatures out of the darkness. But it wasn't until we asked Yvonne, what are you scared of? And she tells us, I'm scared of the jaguar because he might eat us that we realised that in this place, the big bugs were really the least of our problems. As the project developed, something interesting happened. People started coming to us and asking if they could do the interviews too. And soon, we had recordings coming in from places we'd never visited, in languages we don't even speak. To date, we've tens of thousands of answers in 35 languages and we've worked with producers across Africa, Asia, Europe and the Americas. In Rwanda, in Africa, we worked with two young producers called Richard and Adelite, and they told us that we really must interview a man called Ciprini. Richard explained to us that Ciprini had recently been released from prison and reunited with his family. Ciprini had killed many people, during the genocide in Rwanda, a time when approximately a million people were killed, and much of that killing was done not with guns and bombs, but with machetes, long knives, ordinarily used by people for working in the fields. We spent the whole morning with Suprine and his family, and it gradually became clear that he was a man of very few words. I mean, he'd hardly said anything to any of us that whole time. And we were starting to brace ourselves for the shortest interview ever. Adelite volunteers to do the interview, and he begins leaning forward, wanting to connect. But Sprine is leaning back, slightly hunched in his chair. But Adelite continues confidently with the questions, and then there's a change. Prini starts to straighten up, and then he too is leaning forward, intently engaged with the young man opposite him. 
Afterwards, we ask Adelite about what Sukrini has said. And when we get to the question on fear, Adelite takes a long, deep breath. Sukrini says, I'm scared when I do wrong. I'm very scared. And if possible, I try to stop it. Later on, we ask Adelite about his own experience during the genocide. And he says to us, I was just a baby in 1994 when this happened, and I don't have any clear memories of that time. But one thing I do remember vividly is lying in my cot and hearing the sound of loud footsteps outside, and then a commotion, and then silence. Adelite went on to explain to us that both of his parents were killed during the genocide. And we realised that we had witnessed not just an interview, but an act of catharsis between these two men. An orphan survivor had volunteered to question a perpetrator of the genocide. Recording many interviews, we noticed patterns in the answers. We started to see similarities between different people. For example, a student from Kashmir gets angry about about lies in the same way as a Hollywood celebrity on Beverly Boulevard, or a taxi driver in Beirut feels safe at home with his family in the same way as a Mayan kite maker. The kite makers in question, and they make kites like no other. We're talking beautifully ornate kites the size of houses. Kites that take several days, almost a year to build, and then they are shown just once at the Day of the Dead celebrations. With great care, Oscar unfurls the kite he's been working on and he puts it up as a backdrop for our interview. What are you scared of and why? Oscar pauses and then he looks directly into the camera and says, I'm scared we're all the same. I'm scared that we're all the same. That answer to this question comes back to me many times, long after Helen and I have packed up our things and said goodbye. Oscar's answer to this question about fear, to me, asks its own question about the work that we're doing, about the project itself. Are Helen and I going and asking all of these questions to all of these people around the world in the hope that we will find similarities Are we trying to discover that we are all the same? I think that it's not only our similarities that connect us, but also our differences, don't you? We needn't expect to be the same, to know that we are connected. I think understanding this has never been more important than it is in the world we live in right now. Questions and the answers they raise can open up new worlds to you, help you to connect, help you to reconnect. They can reveal answers that you never expected. They can provoke questions that you never imagined. Questions have the power to create change, both in how you think and in how you act. When was the last time that you asked your mother, your brother, your daughter, your friend, the person sitting next to you, a powerful question? If you could ask anybody anything, what question would you ask? Thank you.